What's going on everyone, Nick Lahiri here, Essel Environmental. Um, today, very excited to have the one, the only, Isaac Abed, is that the way to, proper yeah, way to say it? That's right. Perfect, from HP Investors, and obviously, if you've been under a commercial real estate rock, uh, you don't know, but he is the one of the biggest deal makers in the most hottest real estate market in the country, Uptown Oakland. Isaac, welcome. Thank you, yeah. So, uh, I just want people to understand your involvement in commercial real estate and how you got involved with HP and how you ended up, because I know HP is originally based in San Diego, yeah. and how you ended up in Northern California. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I'm from up here, uh, was working in, in, on the institutional side in San Francisco uh, when, I, when I started yeah. uh, out of business school, and HP was basically launched by a friend and I um, about eight and a half years ago in San Diego, so we kind of came together. Uh, he was in institutional real estate in New York, from San Diego, um, his family was in the business, and we kind of both have been talking, and, and you know, that was the that was kind of the the bottom. Well, it wasn't quite the bottom, but it was pretty dang near the right, bottom right. Of, of the cycle. And so, both of us were uh, not exactly seeing a lot of activity in our in our jobs, and and wanted to you know thought it was a good opportunity to take the entrepreneurial step, and uh, you know part and parcel of that. Of, of kind of launching it with him was going down to San Diego, nice. um, which proved to be a really good decision. I think when we started, we we thought there was opportunity in the market just because the market was kind of at, at a low point. Yeah. Um, and then quickly formed a thesis on investing in urban environments. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, given that downtown San Diego is in our backyard, that was that was the one for us to focus on. Okay. Um, and what brought me back to Northern California was as our company started to evolve and grow and we got some deals under our belt and really uh, started to gain some momentum, um, it made natural sense for us to think about, okay, what was another market with a secondary market with you know, an urban fabric that had you know, upside potential. Right. For us, uh, on the operator side, going to a San Francisco or going to you know, a, a New York, um, and we've done deals in New York, but that those aren't where the opportunities are. The opportunities are kind of forming a thesis around uh, up and coming downtown area. And so, right. uh, 20, and it's 2013, beginning of 2014 is kind of when we decided to make the move. Came up here in the middle of 2014 and then kind of went from there. So really then kind of tried to apply the learnings from downtown San Diego. And, and obviously the two markets are different, yep. but really tried to, you know, open a second outpost, so to speak. Nice. So like in the last, you said, you know, eight and a half years since you, and especially since you've been up here in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. you've done about what, 12 deals Yeah, like, in Oakland area. So then um, what would you say, looking back, what would be something that surprised you about Oakland? Um, surprised me about Oakland? You know, I think I've been surprised at how quickly the entire attention of the institutional world has turned mm. to, to Oakland. I, Obviously, I'm, I, I welcome it because the underpinning of our thesis was that we'd get here, downtown Oakland was changing, right. you, know, you were going to see development activity, but um, the magnitude and the, uh, of, the, of enthusiasm in downtown Oakland, it seems like it just kind of it almost like doubles every year. And so coming in 2014, which if you think about it, it's not that long time ago, right, right. Um, there were there were a handful of guys in town, but there were a lot of guys that weren't and kind of not convinced. I remember having conversations with people when we were making the move, when I was making the move to Oakland, who were giving me the, you know, the well-worn kind of uh, feedback on downtown Oakland. and Like when Oakland heats up, the market is done, like stuff Yeah, like but that. even like kind of redlining it for all the reasons you, you would think about, you know, it's not institutional, it's like, you know, you know so um, that was, that was four years ago. And now you look at, yeah. you, don't even, you know, everywhere you turn, there's a new institutional partner coming into town. Right. So that's been the most surprising thing. Okay. I think, frankly, the rest of it, it's kind of what I, I mean, I wouldn't have been here if I didn't think some of this stuff was going to happen. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so for you then, now looking at potentially, you know, we're seeing cranes, you know, in Oakland like mm -hmm. we've never seen before. Yeah. Ground up development in both multifamily, mixed use, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that, that all plays into your thesis. Now, do you, now that you're looking forward to 2018, let's say, 
Um, what are some things you're learning from your success you've had in Oakland and what other areas are you kind of focusing on as potentially the next the next Oakland, if you will, or, yeah. or do you think there's enough left in Oakland now to just focus here and kind of? I mean, I think there's there's still opportunity in Oakland. Yeah. I think one of the one of the foundations of our our platform is being you know an inch wide and a mile deep. So we've focused in con really concentrated focus in urban markets. So San Diego, Oakland are kind of the two main places. We've started to do some investments in Portland. We've done three deals in Portland, um, actually two deals in Portland, we're looking at a third. Uh, and when you have that strategy, you can kind of go back in and mine for mm -hmm. opportunity. Um, that isn't to say we wouldn't find another one, but I think Oakland, people always want to talk about what inning you're in or where you are right. in the transformation. I think, you know, we're kind of built for multiple cycles. Yeah. We try to buy deals that we think can you know, we're, we're obviously incentivized to execute business plans on, on a time, you know, with a time uh, incentive. Right. But there is also access to capital that we have that can kind of look beyond whatever cycle we're in. And so, you know, a good number of our deals in Oakland and San Diego and, and in Portland are built on uh, a belief that these aren't markets that you're playing the cycle that you're, but you really see, you know, you're really part of the transformation. Got it. So that allows us to go kind of still now and still kind of look at opportunities in this market. So when you, when for example, deals you've done in here in, in Uptown, mm -hmm. right? Uh, once the deal is done, and obviously we've worked on a couple of deals, so mm -hmm. then once the deal is done, could you take us a look from an organizational standpoint? Because I remember what, you were basically one of a few people from HP up here originally, right? I was the one the, person. The one person, right. So now the organization has grown significantly. So when you, close a deal, right? Yeah. What, from an operation and execution standpoint, yeah. what are the, generally what are the steps after and are those already sort of in place as you're kind of closing? Yeah, I mean, we, we've we evolved this over time as we brought more resources in, um, but we have a team in place. You know, we have a, a great team um, on the asset management side and on the construction management and the right. property management side that get involved as we're nearing close. So they were getting, they get involved at, in, there's a due diligence phase, the yeah. pre-close phase, and then obviously executing your business plan, and then obviously managing the execution. I mean, like I said, we're, in some of our assets, we execute the business plan and we'll still hold it. So then that's ensuring that you're continuing to deliver good property management and yeah. service is important. So different people get involved in different steps of the way, but you know, as an example, our construction manager on the due diligence side, you know, based on the business plan we're trying to formulate, will help put you know a scope of work around our vision, put pricing, which is obviously important around yeah. our vision, and then as we get into close, that number will get refined. Um, we may start teeing up uh, different general contractors, etc. And then once we're executing, you know, that's something that he's running with. I'm interfacing right. with him. Our asset management team's interfacing with him to make sure that. Things are happening on budget, on time, and so it's really a collaborative process. So I, I'll have weekly meetings with with the whole team yeah. where we talk about deals in the pipeline, deals that we already own, and go through kind of property by property what the issues are. Got and it. And make sure that everyone's coordinated. And and generally, does a business plan be driven by the area or the market, or like per building? Like, would your execution plan potentially differ on? every building, even if it's within a, you know, two mile radius? Yeah, I mean, every business plan is different. I mean, obviously there's commonalities in your market, so right. we're not gonna ignore something we've learned on one office building yeah. for one that we, you know, for another one that we own if it, they're a couple of blocks apart from each other. Um, but, you know, they all have somewhat slightly different nuances to them, right? One, one business plan may be to take an office space to a certain spec, another one may be to do something a little bit different depending on who the investors and depending on what our business plan for that deal is. Got it. Yeah. In your in your sort of you're just finding the deals, etc. Um, what are some key relationships that you have looked back on and relied on? Is it, for example, getting access to deals from like broker relationships or straight principal level connections you have that have kind of said, hey, yeah. this may be coming down the pipe. Yeah, I mean, it's like there's no one yeah. way to, to find a deal. I think going back to kind of being very concentrated in a market, you know, you do 
you build momentum, right? There's like a little right. bit of a snowball effect. You do your first deal, then your second, and then your third, and then you know you you start to get known in the market. So I think that's been something we've taken advantage of. Right. Getting that first deal was many times harder than getting the eleventh, right? In, in the sense of um, seeing that opportunity. Yeah. You know, um, but it can come from anywhere. I mean, you can be you can be driven by a tenant d- Got it. demand. And you know, we bought a. We bought buildings in Oakland that were driven by a tenant and tow situation where we were working with the tenant and seeing if we could find space to uh, a broker that we assisted uh, providing some information on a BOB and then we kind of sort of sourced the opportunity that way yeah. to going directly to the principals. So I mean, we've, we, and, and for us, obviously, you know, our value is in finding good deals. So. Um, we try to, you know, kind of use whatever information advantage we can, we can right. leverage. Um, if you were starting HP today, mm-hmm. 2018, right? Mm-hmm. Where would you be looking right now in terms of basically kind of, once again, I know you've echoed this a couple of times where mm-hmm. it's like an inch wide, a mile deep where you are, or would there be certain areas where you're just like, Hey, if we were starting out, like yeah. this is where we would kind of, or even this asset type. Yeah, if I was starting HP right now, that's a good question. I mean, I think right now, you know, when we started, there were so many assets that had, you were buying well below replacement cost. Um, you could see that the fundamentals had weakened to a point where, you know, you things could always get a little bit worse, but you felt like you had a lot of upside. So we were able to buy a lot of existing assets and do some repositionings or do some lighter value add, right? Um, do a lot more structuring, I think now, and we're actually evolving more in this uh, as well. And we're fortunate that we've had the growth and the runway to build our business and to build our um, competencies, but we're having to go deeper in the value chain to, to generate um, you know, the, re- the types of returns that make sense. Got it. I mean, part of the way we offset having to like go ground up development on every deal to get to the returns that Know, seem to make sense or go into some tertiary location even within downtown Oakland yeah. or downtown San Diego or Portland is to find capital partners that see the long range vision with us and to structure our deals in a way that allow us to hold through cycles. Got it. Yeah. So, you know, from a capital mar- a partner standpoint, do you find yourself now 2018 with your sort of mm-hmm. not what you've done mm-hmm. and what HP's done it's kind of more pitching and saying this is what the plan is versus I would imagine when you're starting out it's more like getting people to buy in and saying this is what we could really this is what it could really be or do you find like your I guess your perspective on bringing people along is more like this is what we see and this is what we're going to do versus more pitching or selling right is there really selling any more needed in this market or markets you're looking at Uh, I mean I think I understand the question but I, I for for it was harder, it was more, it was a different sell in 2014 than it is in 2018. And that's not, part of that is a reflection of what we've done in the market. Right. And part of that's a reflection of where the market is. So I think we've been able to leverage both. So those conversations have become easier, which you need because the opportunity has become, you know, people are having to make a deeper bet. Right. right? So, I mean, I think, you know, and I also believe that to, as a caveat to that, whenever whatever time you're in the market, you're paying the fair price, right? You know, when off like price, the market, like the market, market price. Fair, so right? you're yeah. So we're, so it's you know some people were like, was it easier before? I mean, I guess to the extent that you know, depending on your view of the rest of the, you know how long this this cycle goes or, or how much runway there is in rent growth, um, you may think you know you got to dig deeper or whatever. Or you got to take a bigger bet, right? But um, but yeah, certainly. I mean, when we showed up into town, Oakland hadn't matured, and we were kind of a new kid on the block. So yeah, it was it was a lot more to sell in terms of both the sponsor and the sponsor's location or yeah. opportunity. Now it's everyone loves Oakland, and you know we're kind of we're kind of established. Does it kind of annoy you sometimes how much people love Oakland now? Does it annoy? Yeah, like we've been here, man. Like we get it. No, no. <laughs> you know, it's not like I said. It wasn't too long ago where right. I was that guy that just showed up in Oakland, and people were kind of. And so, I, I, my memory is, it's not that long ago where I was kind of the new kid on the block and trying to elbow my way in and and have people take you know 
our efforts and our interest in the city seriously. Right. Um, I also think you can't do it yourself. I mean, I can't build, I can't be the person that says, well, I want no one else in town or, yeah. or whatever. And I think, and, and, and competition and having more people in here just makes you sharper. Right. So, you know, I think, I think it's kind of a benefit to everybody. Nobody can do every deal. Right. Right. Um, and I mean, then, then people play in different food groups. So I love seeing the spec office buildings. I love seeing, uh, the high rise multifamily because that just kind of furthers the transformation and, you know, really proves out the thesis that we have coming in. And so with kind of, you know, we talked about in the past a little bit about doing different types of deals. So for example, either ground up or mm -hmm. multifamily mm -hmm. as, as the market continues moving forward and et cetera, mm -hmm. do you see yourself potentially looking at deals like that in terms of yeah. completely different than what yeah, you Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, downtown San Diego, we started out uh, two guys, right? Right. We had thin, thin staff, as thin as it gets almost, um, buying a lot of established assets. Yeah. And, you know, our value was more in like kind of lease up. And if I look at San Diego as a model for where Oakland could go and what we're trying, we're starting to kind of germinate out here, we've now started to become, you know, partners on spec office buildings, type one developments, et cetera. So, you know, we, we've evolved in that market where we started earlier um, to be deeper in the value chain yeah. and, and, and offer kind of a broader set of, of uh, competency to our investors. And right. I think that that's something we're starting to do here. You know, we started buying retail here. Uh, we moved into office. Uh, now we're exploring some development, some multifamily development. So similar, similar chart. Now, obviously it's, it's a different market. Right. You've got to build up your team and make sure you're not, you know, uh, building your organization too quickly. Uh, we kind of work. I kind of tell people that we're the group that like, shortens, you chokes up on the bat and tries to hit, hit doubles. Yeah. And you can score the runs that way, or you can try to hit a home run. So um, I think as long as we be, we're mindful of that we're let's let's kind of keep trying to hit singles and doubles and you know you never know what happens. So I'm going to take that analogy. So that sports analogy, right? So on a baseball team. Are you like the skipper slash manager, or are you like the cleanup guy coming in, in third, and you know, like the Aaron Judge of the Yankees type situation, where you're just like the rainmaker hitting, you know, getting the big ones in? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, as the organization has grown, right? Yeah. Do you? How do you balance your time? So, for example, you know, back in the day, I would imagine you were 100% focused on, or much more focused on deals, right? Mm -hmm. um, has that changed as the organization has grown? Yeah, I mean, I think that you're managing a staff more, you're managing kind of your, a team more. Right. So, I mean, I guess managing. Um, I mean, you're still doing a lot. Player coach, yeah. maybe it's player <laughs> coach. Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm still heavily involved in day-to-day. -day. Right. I'm still running around, I'll still talk to tenants, I'll still, um, I just came from an architect's office, you know, so I'm still kind of deep in the weeds. Nice. I like that, I, yeah. like, I like that prop part of it, and, and, you know. I you know, people have said, to some extent, I probably have acknowledged that I'm a little bit of a control freak, but um, no, but I mean, I rely on my team. And there are right. things that like, I, <laughs> we don't have the bandwidth to do. So yeah, it's, and that's that's not an Oakland thing or a San Diego, right, it's right. just part of a growing organization. Right. So like, yeah, man, managing a growing team and um, also being mindful of uh, how big, how big and how quickly you want to get big. Right. So for us, we've been trying to be mindful of that too, as we kind of deal with an evolving cycle. Right. Yeah. And so for um, construction costs, right? So once, you know, the acquisition is made, mm -hmm. there's obviously, that seems for, in conversation with a lot of developers mm -hmm. across the board, especially mm -hmm. in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. it's like, hey, you know, construction costs, labor, et cetera. <coughs> How are you finding yourselves managing the aspect or the sometimes the unknown of that, which is the construction sort of cost or the labor market in general with construction? I don't know, man. Some, I mean, at times we haven't managed it well. Yeah. You know, at times we, in the sense that like we've, I think we do our best to make sure that we have uh, a good sense of what our pricing is going to be right. on TIs or on capital and, and, you know, this market's just so dynamic right now um, that it's, it's scarcity, right? Supply right. and demand. And so we found that our, and then some regulatory things, right? Like, you know, you have Title 24, which you know, you know, you know is happening and you knew is coming, but it, it just, it adds to the list of things you need to do. And as you add more 
requirements to your scope of work, right? There's more opportunity for your cost to vary, right? And and it hasn't varied to the negative too much. We haven't had positive right. variances, as we call it. So, um, you know, we do the best we can. Um, I think the lot. This goes back to what I was talking about with the con our construction manager and and kind of getting our team involved up front. Is we try to make sure we have as much time to get as close to an accurate bit as possible. Nice. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to say that we've we've always hit it, like right the nail you know right, right on the head. So. And generally, from a perspective, and, and you know, you service providers like us, yeah. Do you typically like to, from a perspective, and just having done so many deals in the different types, right? Do you like to go with like whether it be structural engineers, etc. People that have been around and, and have done deals with you or around you, or do you, are you also looking for the new sort of new company, new GC that maybe be able to be more nimble or, or engineer or whatever? Like when you when you talk about a team or a service provider, uh -huh. like what are some of the things that you look for when you're bringing someone on to your fifth deal or your tenth deal? Right now, it's responsiveness um, is the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, I think. You want to make sure that whoever you bring on is engaged, mm -hmm. responsive, timely. Um, you know, you obviously want things to be on budget and on time, but you know that that can change, or that can be a function of change orders right. or, or you know uh, conditions you discover on the ground. So I don't have particular. I mean, I'm obviously sensitive to that, but I'm understanding of that. It's. It's the things within the control of your relationship with uh, with the group that I care most about. Yeah, you know, I think time is money, and mind space. Yeah, you asked a question about how I manage kind of with everything going on. Right. Obviously, us being having more assets and being busier than we were when we started up here, um, and that really goes a long way to alleviating the mind space. Yeah, is when you have a group that's kind of proactive and engaged and responsive. So, in terms of how I think about who, and, you know, you try to make sure you have more than one. Right. And, but at the same time, you try, part of accomplishing responsiveness and and, and all that is to be somewhat loyal, right? You, you know, you want to go back to the same groups that, that you, you know, have treated you well, so, you know, they continue to, that, that you build that relationship. Right. So I think it's kind of a balancing act of making sure that you're not going out farming this to, farming a, uh, any assignment to, too many people, right? But at the same time, knowing that if like, hey, people get busy, you know, right? You're a great service provider. If you have twenty five things happening and and you know all happen, all do on one day, you know, we have you would tell us maybe you wouldn't for the sake of this thing, but you might say like, <laughs> hey, I, I have uh, I got a lot of things going on, and we'd have an honest conversation about that. So right, but that that is true of any vendor. Cool. Well, perfect. Well, thank you very much for joining. I think that does it for us. All right. Um, Isaac, this is a very uh, high pressure question. Mm -hmm. Looking forward again, um, what is something that you're most optimistic about, real estate or construction or development in general, um, moving forward? What am I most optimistic about? Um, I'm optimistic about just kind of where this, I'm. I think downtown Oakland is transforming. Yeah. And I'm optimistic that, you know, people were all, are always worried about is there a, is are things going to go back? Oakland's not going back at this point. There's just too much happening here. So that's what I'm most optimistic about is that we're in part of a transformation and transformations by definition don't happen multiple times. So it's really exciting for me. I think that uh, I feel fortunate to be kind of in a city close to where I grew up. Right. I've always really loved and so I kind of sometimes pinch myself that I'm in an area that's that I get to be there and active while it's going through that transformation because there will be cycles up and down but I think this is kind of just totally new new territory for for this city and so lucky to be part of it nice I like one last question right. how do you close and how do you celebrate deals you close it's very important um, um, you know, back when back when I started, everyone used to give out these deal tombstones. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like a low man on the totem pole. You know, I was like in my mid twenties or whatever. And I was like, man, someday I'm gonna get I'm gonna get that that crystal sap like that fake crystal thing and have a whole mess of them. And you know, that just 
no one does that anymore. Yeah. So now I'm closing all these deals and I don't get any of that swag. Um, I'm boring, man. I, I we do like a closing dinner. Right. Um, when we sell a deal, which is when you really succeed, you uh, celebrate a close. Uh, my business partner and I will swing a little golf trip action. Nice. So that's don't fun. forget your environmental guy. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. without the phase one. Coming well, you got also you got also right. make sure that the the fairway is nice. That's and, right. Because you know, I'm always I'm, you gotta make sure I'm that dirt, you for you guys. Sure that you know? dirt's clean. I don't want you guys playing yeah. dirty dirt. No, wherever that may be. I know. So Isn't that what they do with next all time the, you guys are going jet setting? They turn it into fairways. Yeah, exactly. All right. So next time you're jet setting, bring me along. I'm a good caddy. All right. And you phase one on the side. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. See you.